You're watching Taste the Victory. Everyone loves Marvel vs. Capcom, from the good times to the Zero May Cry times. The blitz-paced, hyper-flashy, thrilling fighting game series has been one of the most beloved crossovers in the entire video game medium. But after the lackluster Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, it had a lot of people expressing interest in Capcom just making Capcom vs. Capcom already, so they don't have to be at the mercy of the partner's demands. This company has over 25 years of history with a staggering amount of iconic franchises and characters. A Versus series game of only in-house characters wouldn't lack any star power and would still be just as exciting. So what if I told you Capcom vs. Capcom already exists? Except, it's a card game. Tepin, no I didn't say Tekken wrong, is a free-to-play mobile card game featuring various Capcom franchises ranging from the incredibly popular Resident Evil all the way to the more obscure like Breath of Fire. Look, trust me old heads, I know that sentence hurt but we're way past due a new game at this point. Booster sets are made up of characters and events from these franchises and function like a real-life card game in terms of opening packs to get cards. The game has four colors with characteristics unique to them and each hero that you play is assigned to a color. Red is very aggressive, focused on reaching big attack numbers and doing large ping damage to the board. Green is health recovery based and about protecting your units. Purple stuns and steals units and black is the graveyard focus deck. All the currently playable heroes are Ryu, Rathalos, Jill Valentine, Amaterasu, X, Chun-Li, Nero, Feline from Monster Hunter, Morrigan, Dante, Zero, Ada Wong, Albert Wesker, Nurhigante, Akuma, and Oichi. Teppa's unique twist on the traditional card game genre is that it's real time. There are six lanes cards can be placed in, three per player. When a card is placed, a line starts marching towards the player. After it reaches the opposing player, your card performs an attack. Cards can be dropped in the same lane to block this attack, in which case the blocking card will do a counter attack based on its attack stat on the top in red. Similar to its fighting game roots, reaction time is important in this game. You'll often want to block at the last possible second so your opponent can't play down an answer to your block in time or to mess up their timing to secure lethal. Each hero even has their own super, or hero art as they're called, similar to fighting games. Three per character in fact, very reminiscent of Street Fighter 4. These freeze time in the game for their cinematic and reset everything you were hovering over. So on top of being powerful effects, timing them right to interrupt your opponent is also key. While all that's going on, you are gaining something called MP split up in sections at the bottom of the board. This gauge always refills as time passes in a match and is the equivalent to mana in Magic the Gathering that you need to cast cards and pay for their costs. The great thing about this being a constantly generating, always accessible energy resource is you never have to worry about losing a game to mana screw and not being able to play the game. And trust me, battles in this game get crazy. Things will get so intense I'll randomly win out of nowhere because I didn't realize a lane was left unguarded and it's a breath of relief before hopping right into the next battle. When all the lanes are full, it's chaos. Strategy ranges from comboing together cards that have effects that synergize, but depending on the color you play, some decks might prefer to turbo send cards to their graveyard and revive giant monsters that normally would cost way more to play. You can feel like the immovable god Wesker thinks he is and experience the satisfaction when you make an opponent surrender because you've got three world-ending monsters out on the field, or you can build up and reinforce your comrades in battle like Mega Man X, being rewarded for carefully managing all your resources to outwit your opponent. The excitement doesn't just come from big bodies coming out with crazy effects. There's also action cards like spell cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! When you play one, you enter the action phase where both players gain two free bonus MP to help you respond to your opponent's action with your own. This is distinguished by making the two bonus MP blue. Teppin uses a first in, last out system when resolving action cards. As soon as an action card is played, you can chain your own to attempt to negate it or play one of your own action cards for cheaper. Maybe you'll interrupt the effect of your opponent's action card to make it fizzle. Like if they tried to destroy your purple unit, you can maybe self-banish it instead to get the benefits of your cards being banished instead of destroyed. There is nothing cooler than a Yu-Gi-Oh! ass moment of AHA! You played into my trap card! The gameplay itself is so fun and skill rewarding, but as I'm kind of getting at, the representation of each Capcom series is so well done. If you're a regular of the channel, you have an idea of how important flavor is in a card game to me. And let me tell you, I read this Sigma card and immediately stopped playing the game to come start this script. Not every card is going to have flavor, but when the game goes for it, they knock it out of the park, accurately portraying the character's goals, history, or iconic attacks through gameplay. There's a keyword called revenge in the game that makes it so, when destroyed, instead of going to the graveyard, the unit is actually sent back into your deck with a small bonus, usually in buff stats and reduced play cost like a zombie becoming reanimated. This keyword can be used once. The second time it dies, it goes to the graveyard, usually. This legendary Sigma card, meaning you can only have one copy in your deck, has infinite revenge, 
representing Sigma constantly coming back to be one of the final bosses in every Mega Man X game, capturing his relentless nature to usher in his perfect vision of what society should be. You never give up, do you? Even when we break you down to scraps, you always come back. Once this Sigma has triggered Revenge eight times, he starts getting a buff to his stats when played. Eight, like the eight numbered main entries of Mega Man X. God damn it, I love this shit! Another great example is Wind Up Toy Vile. In a recent set, Sherry from Resident Evil falls into a nightmare filled with Resident Evil monsters from her past and some of Capcom's villains. One being a reimagining of Vile as an old timey wind up toy. When a unit is destroyed, Vile becomes stunned for 5 minutes, representing the winding up, and when you're done, you let him go, and there he goes! Off to the tracks to beat my opponent's face in! It's all over the game, and that's even before touching on hero supers like X's Gaia armor, which gives each unit plus 3 HP and bail, meaning they can't be targeted by effects for 13 seconds. Gaia armor is one of the most defensive armors in the Mega Man franchise, even letting him walk on spikes, so this is a neat way to represent that through gameplay. Zero's fighting against inner demon's hero art references his future and his past by either pulling a random action card that boosts his allies or by pulling an action card that brutally destroys his opponents. With that kind of attention to detail, the best part about this being a Capcom only franchise is that the devs get to spread the kind of spotlight and attention to some of their forgotten franchises. Teppin will probably be one of the only things in existence for a long time to consistently give new art, stories, and animations to franchises like Darkstalkers, Breath of Fire, Ghosts and Goblins, and freaking Haunting Grounds. I didn't even know about that last one until this game, and I thought I was a Capcom fanboy. I'm glad something is keeping these series at least a littlest bit relevant. Not only is it cool to see some of these characters find Finally get into new adventures, but it's so fun and charming to see them interact with other Capcom properties and the mischief or hell that it causes. I mean, just check out the story of the super spooky village set. Demons have stolen the princess from Ghosts and Goblins again, but this time they've taken her to Lady Dimitrescu's castle in the village from Resident Evil 8. Arthur has to make it through these villagers, the four lords, and Lady Dimitrescu herself to get to the princess. All the while, Felicia is trying to put on a circus show for Dimitrescu because she loves performing and show business. It's delightfully wacky, yet somehow also fitting. In another set, Turnabout Festival, the focus is Darkstalker, Sengoku Basara, Resident Evil, and Ace Attorney. Someone has turned Imagawa's dog into a T-Virus zombie, and it's up to Apollo Justice to figure out who from our four possible suspects. But we know it's the mischievous BB Hood from Darkstalkers. Her plan was to get a job as Imagawa's dog sitter and get rich, but the dog hated her, so in trying to give it a drug to make him nice, she accidentally gives him the T-Virus. We follow her around as she tries to get rid of guards and prank Excella from Resident Evil 5 to get into Imagawa's VIP suite where the dog is leading up to these events. When Apollo cracks the case, BB Hood's card getting pissed is hilarious. She's just firing off guns in the court. Uh, Apollo Justice, you got some nerve. It was that Mutt's tooth marks that tipped you off, wasn't it? I knew I should have dealt with him there then. That, that little piece of- It's just so great seeing the scenarios the devs come up with to put all these characters together in a way that loosely makes enough sense. Every set is a little treat to look forward to if you enjoy multiple Capcom franchises, and it's not too hard to keep up either. In my experience playing for about 4 months now, Teppin is very free to play friendly. It's best if you stick to one color or two, but you can build up plenty of resources through normal gameplay to create multiple decks and open the newest set by playing the single player, leveling up all the heroes, reaping cards for decks you'll never play, and just playing online normally. There's even a way to gift a bunch of cards to your friends so you can give them a bunch of the highest rarity cards right out the gate. And for the anniversaries of their launch, they do huge things that give you so many cards and resources like one free pack of every set in standard rotation once every day for playing a ranked game. When a new set is about to come out, they'll do special events called GPs and XGPs, which give you an opportunity to earn so much in-game currency to spend on packs when it drops. Just do your couple dailies every day and you'll be fine. There's also a season pass that's actually extremely valued for $5. It can only be bought with the premium currency, Jewels, which can only be obtained by spending real money. But buy it once and it comes with the incredibly easy missions to get more Jewels, and you can buy the Season Pass again next ranked season for free. I've seen people do this free loop for like 2 years straight now. You can basically think of the game as just costing $5 if you really want, and it's free from there. The Season Pass gives you packs, souls to craft cards, alternate arts, and the aforementioned Jewels. As long as you know what you want to build and can manage it, it's all really fair. That's not to say it's completely perfect, the premium currency can also be spent on packs. During special events, the shop will have special packs that can only be bought with this currency. Oftentimes in these packs are X skins, which basically are entirely new characters but over old ones. Chun-Li can become Phoenix Wright, and Nurhigante can become... Felicia? 
Give me more jewels, give me more jewels now, give me more. Unfortunately, the odds for these skins aren't disclosed, but obviously are extremely low. And there's no pity system to at least build up to an alternate color skin for one of the regular heroes. It's really lame and frustrating since there's no way to get these X skins outside of the limited time events and I hate FOMO exploitation. The account system is also really bad. For whatever reason, like a normal game, it isn't tied to your Google Play account, so if you uninstall it, you lose everything. If you play this game, please make sure you go to Other, then you go to Data Transfer, and you create a transfer code, and you have to keep that transfer code somewhere safe, because you'll need to input it on your next device, or if your current phone dies or anything. This is one of the biggest complaints if you look at the reviews in the App Store, and it's been like four years without a fix to this, so, you know, as long as you know what to do now after watching this, you'll hopefully be okay. The balance can also be kind of stupid, introducing one stupidly good deck above all the rest. And you might say, oh, that's just normal card games. Yeah, sure. But it feels egregious in Teppin because some of the strats that have been broken in the past just straight up feel like cards weren't even tested. They were so easy to break or didn't care so as to push the new set or hero. In the first set of the game, Rathalos had a hero art called Wrath Awoken, which gives one unit flight and an attack bonus based on how many times you use cards that boost the attack of your units. This was unscaled. And then Jill Valentine was added as the very first hero. She came with some basic cards that you get for leveling her up. Those were Guile and Carlos, two very cheap combo units. Combo is when you could do an attack twice in a row. So basically you hit with your attack stat twice. So you could just spam getting these incredibly powerful units already super strong. Like once they hit three attack with combo, they're hitting for six. And then in the end game, you just drop one other combo unit, wait until it gets to the very end of their line so your opponent can't react in time, use your hero art, Wrath Awoken, to give them plus a billion and flight, and because a flight ignores the unit in front, you can now combo for like a billion damage and win the game right away, and it was just so stupid with very little counterplay, because these both were beefy units with a lot of HP, so only Black could really fastly, reliably out them. It was just so incredibly dumb. Other times, they're just not fun to play against either, like Morrigan Halt, who stuns then destroys your stunned units. Since these are on play, there's very little counterplay you can do to them, and it just always sucks to be told, no, you don't get to play the game because my deck doesn't let you. Luckily, they're in the process of nerfing this deck and other stupid strategies, but I wish a little more time could go into preventing these from being released in the way they are in the first place. That said, I do firmly believe Teppin is a skill-rewarding game that relies on thinking ahead, reaction timing, and strategizing. You can't give anyone the best deck and expect them to do well. The more familiar you get with this game, the more you'll be able to skill get people with an okay deck versus best deck in the format, unless it's just some really stupid unreactable format. Being fast enough with your swipes is already a big differentiator in skill. For an example of skill used in the game, take Chunli.exe for example. Cards in this deck have Quest, which means when the specified condition is met, they get the specified bonus, usually a buff to their stats. You want to hold until you have 9 to 10 MP, then play out the cards that have Quest and the ones that trigger the Quest together in order. From there, you keep buffing these units to try and build a crazy wall of net navvies. However, the important skill differentiator comes in with being careful not to overinvest. When do you stop healing your guys and recognizing you can let a few die to get an additional quest combo chain going again? When do you actually go all in on keeping a unit alive? It's a fun dynamic to manage. If all that sounds too sweaty for you though, there is fun single player content. You still need an online connection to access it, but there's stories that serve as tutorials in adventure mode and challenge levels, with bot opponents varying from glorified tutorials to run for your life, this is so hard. Similar to Mega Man X Dive Offline, I hope this single player content gets preserved in an offline mode, because this is really one of those mobile card games that takes advantage of the fact it's a video game. You couldn't make this work in real life with the same mechanics, and I think that's really neat. I always love a medium taking advantage of its platform. The alternate arts are the highest rarity in the game and are animated. They look so cool in your deck. And the music, oh my god, the music! It's so, the remixes are so amazing. They go for that epic orchestra scale. It's incredible. You're listening to it right now. This is Zero's theme and it's so good. There's probably so much more I didn't remember to go over, but the bottom line is this game is sick. Oh wait, yeah, 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 like the lore. There is like some kind of ongoing narrative tying all these Capcom characters together somehow, but that's an entirely different video for another day. I've seen people write Bibles worth of text explaining this lore before. It's pretty convoluted, but if you enjoy that stuff, you'll be eating good. 
But I digress. Right now is arguably the best time to get in. We just got the first ever Mega Man Battle Network set introducing that franchise to this game, and the game's population kind of exploded as a result. A lot of decks are viable right now, even if the two best decks are kind of annoying. Because of the nice variety in standard right now, you might not even see those two that much. And oh yeah, there's rotation, so every Palom deck will go away eventually. This game is such a fun celebration of Capcom's history. It's been going for four years now, to my surprise, and here's hoping for another four more. It really shows what can be done with just Capcom characters, so someday I hope we do get a true Capcom vs. Capcom fighting game. Until then though, you should definitely check out Teppin. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones.